morning, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we really appreciate your time this morning. My name is Christian. I'm joined by Keen Garvin, Katie Fano, Paul Mitchell, and today we're here to discuss uh, Ferrero's new supply chain, fun intended. So we'll start with a quick agenda uh, to gloss over how our discussion will go. We'll begin with an executive summary. We'll discuss our recommendations right up front, then dive into the analysis and the justifications. We'll move into a risk analysis as well as an implementation timeline, and then finally end with conclusion and some questions. So when we first took a look at the case, we noticed uh, a lot of different issues, but all service level. We noticed things like price fluctuations, so supply shortages, as well as consumer preferences. So what we wanted to understand was how do these fit together? So how do price fluctuations actually end up affecting the consumer? How do their habits change when the price of their favorite product increases? What we noticed was that all three of these fed into an overlying more of a root cause, which was supply security. And thus, this was the theme we wanted to tackle throughout our recommendations to ensure that we have the supply we need, as well as the cost structure we need, to ensure that we are not increasing prices for consumers. So in order to tackle this, we wanted to have a three-pronged approach, a three-recommendation approach. The first being a backwards integration, supply diversification, so both on the supply and the supplier side, as well as farmer collaboration. So for the backward integration, we recommend purchasing Old Time, which is currently our largest supplier, so that we can uh, reduce our supply chain costs so that any sort of raw material increases in price, we'll be able to absorb those and uh, sort of avoid giving those down to the consumer. For supply diversification, we wanna make sure that we're reducing risk, and as we'll talk about later, we currently see a lot of risk in the supply chain structure as is. And finally, farmer collaboration. We wanna work with farmers on the more social and environmental aspects of their work to help them improve what they do and improve the industry as a whole. And as we put all of these together, we believe that we'll be able to reduce the probability that raw material fluctuations will actually end up increasing prices for consumers. And now Kim will talk more about backward integration. Thanks, Christian. <coughs> so as mentioned, in order to backward integrate, we want to purchase Volcon to allow Ferrero to absorb some of those supply chain cost fluctuations. As it currently stands, these fluctuations in our supply have detrimental impacts to our end consumers, and this is something we want to avoid. This happens through the raw material availability, and when that decreases, our suppliers end up increasing their price for us. Uh, the unit price on the other end ends up increasing for the consumer as well because we have to pay more for our supply, and uh, this ultimately can affect our consumer, consumer habits, and they could potentially switch their, which product they want to. Um, and so to remediate this, we want to backward integrate again by purchasing Ultan, and there are a number of benefits that go with this integration. The first is our reduced overhead and transaction costs uh, through that integration of the supply chain. We'll also have better access to vital farm relationships, which Katie will touch on more later. Uh, we'll also be able to better improve our coordination between our supply chain by having that consistent partner within our supply chain supplier. Um, and finally, we'll ensure competitive parity because uh, through our industry analysis, we've seen that other competitors have taken steps to backward integrate in the same way that we plan to. Um, and so before we went ahead to try to execute this decision, we wanted to use a framework to see whether or not we should do it. So we used the McKinsey four-step uh, integration framework to see whether or not this would be a good fit. So the first being setup costs, uh, we believe that we have the necessary capital and uh, the right amount of asset synergies with uh, Olton to uh, effectively backward integrate with them. Also, the reason that we're here is to reduce those transaction costs and transaction risks, and we feel that those uh, parts of the framework are very favorable in Ferrero's situation. Finally, we will be able to increase our inventory efficiency as well as our capacity utilization, improving our overall coordination effectiveness. This will, um, supp the, our, our supply chain cost savings and coordination will allow Ferrero to absorb an increase in material costs without increasing our actual price for consumers. And with that, I'll pass on to Paul to talk to us about supply diversification. Awesome. So as Christian mentioned, the second pillar of our strategy is in diversification of supply. And we have kind of two sub-approaches to that. So first, I'll be talking about hazelnuts, which is our most important ingredient, um, as we currently buy 25% of the entire world's supply. And then we will look at how we do that. How we want to do that is establishing new crops. So this is geographic diversity. This would help us increase supply, mitigate some of the climate and political risks that are associated with the way it's sourced now, as well as create new opportunities for the future. So within the increasing supply, this is critical um, for us moving forward. 
Um, as we've mentioned, some of our competitors have started to backwardly integrate. Um, so tight, supply is tightening, it's being spoken for. Additionally, both us and our competitors have invested in new plants for our current products, meaning we have strong confidence that in the future we're going to continue this growth. And with an already supp tight supply market, we need to secure that supply, as it takes many years for a new crop to come to maturity. Looking at weather risk, we recently see in this case how a single frost event can impact 25% of the worldwide supply. That's a risk that's absolutely unacceptable, especially for a commodity that's so important to our product. By moving into different regions, we can help mitigate some of this risk and spread out so that one-time weather events don't impact our crop like they have in this instance. Looking at political risks, Turkey has always been considered a relatively stable country. That's where we get almost all of our hazelnuts currently. However, there has been some tension in the area um, as recently as last year with the coup attempt by the military. Those events can happen in a flash. And like I said, maturity for these plants takes many years. So we need to plan in advance for even the remote possibility of something like this happening now so we don't have a tight supply later on. And finally, when we're looking at our opportunities for the future, there are many strains of hazelnuts grown around the world. And so by kind of diversifying our supply, we can also play with some of those new varieties and maybe find something that works better for us. A great example is here in the United States, Oregon and Washington grow a variety of hazelnut that has a stronger hull structure. That allows them to be harvested mechanically, which is much more efficient than how they're harvested in Turkey. Currently there, the hull structure is a lot softer, so they have to be picked by hand. Hazelnuts are usually not taken from the tree. They wait, wait till they drop. And if they all drop at once, you know, a windstorm or something like that, picking them up on the ground is inefficient, and a lot of them are being laid to waste. And we already have a tight supply market, so that's also a risk that's unacceptable to us. Next, I'm going to pass it off to Christian. He's going to kind of talk about some of the other ingredients that aren't in the hazelnut, um, but where we also see some of our risks. Thanks. So as Paul mentioned, we want to focus on hazelnuts as uh, for one part prong of this recommendation, as it's such a key important for this uh, majority of our products. What we also want to focus on too was the rest of the supply chain and our inputs. What we can see here is our factories. So where are we producing these products? And what you'll notice is we're very global. A lot of different continents across all regions. You'll notice a similar trend for our suppliers in the green dots, very global. But the risk we see here is that we are actually single sourcing the majority of our inputs, everything from cocoa to vanilla. The only input that is currently dual sourced is sugar from Brazil and France. We think that's a great trend. Thus, we recommend taking a more strategic approach in how we're sourcing, and instead of looking at the globe as one, single sourcing and taking on the risk of what happens if we have inclement weather or some sort of political instability and we lose supply. We want to focus on looking at the world in two separate regions and shift it so that our factories are getting supplied by suppliers in their region. That way Brazil isn't shipping sugar all the way to Germany. That's instead coming from France. And that's where we place our new recommended potential suppliers in these regions so that we can diversify away the risk that occurs. That way, if a plant does go down, we still have another supplier who can, although it may not be in the region, still supply to that factory. The one uh, caveat here is palm oil. So palm oil is very interesting. 85% uh, of it comes from Malaysia and Indonesia. So diversifying there would be kind of a misnomer. Climate tends to hit those together. However, we also see a consumer trend away from palm oil. In the EU, there have been some thoughts about carcinogens and cancer. Thus, we believe that in the future, companies will continue to divest from palm oil in uh, infrastructure. And in the end, we want to focus on a future state of dual sourcing to really reduce that risk, as well as capitalize on any cost-saving advantages that come from logistics and things like that. And now Katie will discuss our Pharrell <coughs> Farmers Program. Thanks, Christian. So the final part of our recommendation revolves around investing at the farm level. So we have seen some other companies do this with, by investing with their farmers and have continued success for this operation. Uh, we want to call it Ferrero for Farmers, or F for F. So as you can see here, we have identified four uh, key components of this recommendation that we want to highlight for you. First is the technology component. Like Paul mentioned, we want to switch to that mechanized harvesting equipment, and we want to teach other farmers how to use this equipment in their own farms. Our second one is around the environment. We really want to make sure that we're from the bottom up being sustainable in operations, like Christian mentioned, the palm oil issue in Malaysia. We could help uh, switch that ingredient and teach farmers how to sustainably uh, grow that commodity for us. And our third recommendation is collaboration. We really want to uh, share our best practices among farmers and with our uh, program, and ensure that we are having the highest quality ingredients overall from the bottom up at our raw material all the way to our finished product of the Ferrero chocolate. And you tell them. So we 
identified some risks in this uh, recommendation that we are proposing. The first one is that we will lose economies of scale due to our supplier diversification, but this is a very short-term risk and we are willing to accept that. Our second one is that we might fail to operate or integrate Olton with our operations, but we'll have a strong uh, trans, tra tra change management plan in place to ensure that we are realizing this risk from the beginning. And the final recommendation is that we might have capital investment overruns, but we will do our due diligence before we acquire this company to make sure that we are mapping out everything we will do. So in order to complete our strategy, we have a five-phase implementation plan. So that first phase is really short-term. It's acquiring Olson, and that'll guarantee our supply of hazelnuts for our upcoming uh, production. Our second is our farm investments. We really want to build at the farm level and invest in new crops so that we can have a long-term solution to this problem. Our third phase is to expand our suppliers. Like Christian mentioned, we want to diversify. We want to make sure that we are regionally supplying all of our commodities to our plant locations and that we are fulfilling that supply chain at a local level. Our fourth is the Farmers for, 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 for Farmers Program, FRF. We want to make sure that we're building long-term relationships with our farmers and we need to uh, improve our social responsibility in that aspect. And then our fifth is, of course, to evaluate. We want to make sure that we are continuously improving to mitigate our risk, whether it be climate, economic, political, and we are ensuring that we're uh, evaluating that process overall. And with that, Christian will wrap up our presentation. Thanks, Keith. So overall, what we really wanted to understand is that just because we backwards integrate does not increase supply in the market. What it allows us to do is better coordinate our supply chain to reduce costs so that let's say we do take a year where supply does go down, we can absorb the cost there instead of pushing down on consumers. We realize that Nutella and the Rorero consumers as a whole are very brand loyal. They love our products. Therefore, we want to make sure we're giving them a consistent quality at a consistent price. We believe that by diversifying our supply, this will also help us to reduce risks, as well as by growing more hazelnuts in different regions, we can actually increase the global supply as well. And then finally, on a more social and more environmental impact, we want to focus on really working with, with farmers, as a lot of agriculture, large agriculture companies are doing, get down to the farm level, help them improve what they're doing, improve their yield, improve their quality, and help them get a higher uh, price for their product. And in the end, we believe that by doing all of this and by working through all these different recommendations, we'll be able to flatten out any variability, diversify away risk, and ensure that we are not pushing down cost increases, price increases to our consumers. And with that, we would love to open the floor to any questions. Could you talk to me a little bit about the, um, the acquisition and the change management? Sure. Um, I'll go over a little bit of the acquisition. Um, we have uh, some preliminary costs laid out. Um, so it's kind of difficult to get good data for this. Both companies are private, um, so there's not a lot of a disclosure. There's no 10K that we can go dig through. Um, but we did a little bit of financial analysis, um, and we looked and we know that Olton is a $500 million company. We also know that we are 70% of their revenue, so we know we're spending $350 million a year on them. Um, so using that number, we kind of took a approach that we've seen um, some of us, several of us have worked in um, other sourcing organizations, um, and so we've looked and we said, we think we could probably get about a 10% um, cost synergy by merging the two, and that was a pretty conservative estimate there. So we valued that at about $35 million a year. And then we are also looking at profits. So we know that Olton is a $500 million company, like I mentioned. We know that commodity margins are pretty low, so we said maybe about 5% there. And so taking those two valuations together, um, we kind of came up with a 13-year break-even point um, as far as acquisition goes. However, we also want to stress that while there is some financial um, risk and also there is benefit after that 13-year mark in year 20, the ROI would have approached 40 something percent. Um, the primary reason we're doing this is to get away from that risk. So the finances are kind of secondary to it. They support our recommendation, um, but we really want to get out of the risk. And so as far as we're looking at the acquisition, that's where we're looking for that. One other thing to note on the acquisition is that um, in our research, we found that there are industry rumors that Ferrero has been thinking about acquiring Hershey or trying to acquire Hershey. As you can see, Hershey's a vastly um, much, it's much larger than um, Olten is by a magnitude. And so if they're in a position where they think that that's even a possibility or the market thinks that's a possibility, we're very confident that the acquisition of Olten can go well and go smoothly and that we would have the capital to do so. And then I know you mentioned change management as well. So I just want a quick sentence on that. Being 70% of Olten's business, we believe we already have an extremely close relationship with them and that we'd be able to leverage that throughout the change management, management process 
to ensure all the synergies we're talking about and to move away from the risk that that carries. And with this acquisition, how do you think that Hershey is going to respond or react to this? So I think he and um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So Hershey is a family-owned company as well. Um, and back to our potential uh, purchase or acquisition of Hershey, uh, we currently have an alliance with them. So in 2011, um, Hershey and Ferrero realized that we're not competing on warehousing and inventory and the distribution, so the, the logistics part of our business. So in all of North America, we actually have a strategic alliance that says that we're going to share our logistics and distribution assets since uh, we, we want to create a more uh, environment, environmentally sustainable uh, logistics and distribution part of our business. So Hershey, we, we have a strong relationship with them. We have a strategic supply chain uh, alliance with them. And we think that uh, we're a very good company. I also think too that, uh, as we mentioned earlier, Calibo had done something similar to what we're recommending. They actually bought their nut supplier. So we're thinking that that is going to be a continuous trend. So maybe seeing Hershey respond in a similar manner uh, would be a high probability. Thank you. You talked about your second strategy, <clears throat> sorry, your second problem of the approach was the dual sourcing of the hazelnuts. How does the dual sourcing and thus moving to less reliance on Oltan affect the payback or the benefits of acquiring Altan. Awesome. Um, yeah, so what we're really, so um, there's kind of two approaches. So one was that we want to diversify suppliers, and the other was diversify supply. So in hazelnuts, we do want to continue to work with Altan. The idea is that after we acquire them, we use them as they're running the Altan subsidiary to then establish new um, crops throughout the world. So we would still be working with Altan. We want them to manage it because they know how to manage these kind of farmer relationships, and that's not our core competency. But as a now operating subsidiary of us, we would want them to move and find new locations to source hazelnuts from. So it'd still be contained within our supply chain, and then, of course, all of that value is then being rolled up to Ferrero, the parent company, at the end. Uh, similar question. You talked about Holtan's margins being 5%. I'm guessing that it's going to be lower than Ferrero. So how, what does this do to the overall profitability of Ferrero acquiring them? We believe that it would increase profit, or profitability because um, even setting the market structure aside, um, the bigger piece of that pie was the projected cost synergies and savings. So you know, even if, say, their margins were razor thin as a nut supplier and it was 0.1% and really we're not going to get any value out of them in terms of profit, um, that's still okay because we have cost um, savings that we can realize. And once again, the financials kind of come secondary to that risk. Um, as we're seeing, um, as we saw in the case, nut prices in some instances went up like 60%. Um, so taking a small, you know, two to five percent margin hit structure uh, on the margin structure um, is definitely offset by mitigating a risk where our supply prices might go up 60, 70 percent. One other thing to note is. Well, we currently get almost all of our hazelnuts from Holton. Um, that's 70% of the company. So that means Holton, as it exists today, is selling 30% of their product to other people. So there is a little bit of excess capacity there. So if we own them, we can sell the capacity that we don't need to use internally to other suppliers, um, potentially on the spot market at a much higher price, um, boosting that overall margin structure, but really securing our supply and then the other financial benefits are kind of secondary so overall, uh, our recommendation is to get our supply chain in order to support the consumer. So in our case, we were given the consumer example of someone that loves Nutella and she's not willing to substitute, she's not willing to give it up. So if we can ensure that supply to make sure we can get her that product uh, without increasing it to a premium price that she can't afford, that's really our end goal. So adjusting our supply chain, taking that ownership in-house, that's really our goal overall with the old acquisition is ensuring the hazelnut supply. What do you think Hershey's response is going to be? I think uh, as direct competitors, I think it'll be similar. So I think what we're going to see um, in this industry as well is that since the margins are so low and that the risk is so high, for example, just hazelnuts, we think that uh, a trend will be this backward integration. But Hershey's, however, is a little bit different. They're actually forward integrated. 
So they own their distribution, which is uh, something that we thought about, but we didn't think it really fell into confidence as a Ferrero. So we weren't sure if Hershey's was really ready to take that step, though, to own everything from the producer all the way to the distributor. And one, one short quip about Hershey is that 81% of their shares are actually family owned. And so the like, they've been uh, swatting off acquisitions since they've been created. Uh, so long term, we really see a, more of an alliance or more of a partnership with Hershey. Then um, even, even though we did entertain an acquisition with Hershey, we see them as a long-term partner. I think one last thing on the Hershey thing, if you look at their product portfolio, we do compete in that chocolate spread market, but that's really about it. Um, a lot of our other more European chocolate competitors have more of these, uh, like the Ferrero Rocher products, like with the hazelnuts. A lot of the Hershey products are more uh, revolve around peanuts or almonds, um, like Hershey bar with almonds. They don't use as much hazelnut as we do as well. So us moving into the new, us acquiring the hazelnut distributor um, might not impact Hershey as much as we might think because we're not really, we're really competing on that differentiating factor of using the hazelnuts in a lot of our products.